How to knit socks for beginners. Hi everyone, my name is Norman. I run the blog nimbleneedles.com and today I want to show you everything you need to know about knitting socks, even if it is your first time. I know a lot of knitters are intimidated by socks, but honestly, I think they are one of the easiest fitted garments to knit. So in this video, I'll take you by the hand and we'll knit this beautiful pair of striped socks together. We'll do it the traditional way. This means bottom down with a gusset on double pointed needles to produce a pair that will fit no matter your size or your gender. And really, don't be scared, not of the double pointed knitting needles or anything else. I'll show you every single technique step by step so you can easily follow along and get it right the first time even if you're a beginner. I'll show you how many stitches you need to cast on and how to figure out your size, how to knit a sock heel and how to finish your sock. As a result, this will be a very detailed and long video. But I wanted to give you the opportunity to see exactly how I knit these socks, how I make them fit perfectly and how I make them look really, really neat on top of that. And you know, not reduce uh, the process to oversimplified instructions that are barely good enough for your first beginner pair. <laughs> By the way, make sure to hit that thumbs up button right now in case you like this approach. Anyway, let's show you how to knit socks the easy way. First, let's quickly talk about the materials you will need because for socks, this is an important issue many beginners sadly neglect. Obviously, you will need yarn but pick something that specifically says sock yarn. I can't stress enough how important this is. A lot of people go for the first DK or fingering um, yarn they find, and then their socks end up with holes after the second or third wear. Instead, pick a nice wool and acrylic or nylon blend that says sock yarn. And also make sure to pick a yarn that is machine washable, Usually it says something like superwash on the label. I am using a very lovely sock yarn by Summerlin Dye Works. I'll put a link in the description below along with all the other items you need. I am knitting with these three colors here to get some nice stripes, but you can also just knit with one color and actually it will be a bit easier and my instructions will make sense either way. So how much yarn do you need for socks? 150 grams of fingering sock yarn should be plenty for almost all feet. If you have small feet, so below size 9, you will probably get away with 100 grams, while for size 12 or above, you will probably need more than 150 grams. It will also depend a bit on how high up the calf you want to go. Then you need a set of double pointed knitting needles matching the weight of your yarn. Anything from size one to three will work. I'm using the Knitter's Pride Carbons needles in size 2.5 millimeters. And then you will need scissors and a tapestry needle, a measuring tape, stitch markers, a crochet hook to pick up stitches and fix mistakes, and this is entirely optional needle stoppers that keep your stitches from falling off the needles. You will also need that pattern for these socks. It's for free. So head over to my blog. It's the first link in the description below and download it now. You will need it. Anyway, let's head over to my desk and start knitting socks together. The first and most important question is, how many stitches to cast on for socks? To figure that out, we will have to knit a little swatch, measure it and do some easy calculations. Step one, you need to knit a flat swatch in stock in its stitch that is around 10 centimeters or four inches wide and roughly as high. I cast on 30 stitches and knit across 30 rows. It's important that you're using the same needle and the same yarn you intend to knit your socks with. 
then you need to wash this swatch the way you would wash your socks and block the swatch. This is really important because it will tell you how your sock yarn will behave after washing and you don't want to end up with uh, socks one size too big or small. Once your swatch is dry, you need to measure out five centimeters in the middle of your swatch and count how many stitches you need to cover those five centimeters. In my case, that's 13 stitches. Obviously, you can also measure out two inches. Write down that number. Next step, you need to measure your feet at their widest point. Typically, it's here around the heel. For me, that's 31 centimeters. And write down that number as well. And the last step is a very easy calculation. Divide the number of stitches you counted by five centimeters or two inches, and this will give you how many stitches you need to cover one centimeter or one inch. And then multiply this number times uh, the circumference of your feet at their widest point. In this case, it's 31 centimeters times 2.6, and it's 80.6 stitches. And then you need to figure in the comfortable maximum stretchiness of stockinette stitch. So what I do is I subtract 15%. So that's 80.6 80 80 stitches times 0 0.85. And that's 68.5 stitches. And now you only need to round to the next number dividable by 4. And that's how many stitches you need to cast on. A word of warning here. We all knit with a different tension and not all yarns behave in the same way. So this calculation works in this case, but it's impossible for me to predict how your knitted fabric will behave. This is only a reliable first step. Still, I could be spending the next half hour talking about negative ease, yarn properties and knitting perfect swatches. But I think it's much easier to start with a nice approximation, knit 20 or 30 rounds and check if you are right. Simply slip on your work in progress. And if you're off a couple of stitches, well, you can unravel and start over again. This will still be faster than trying to knit a perfect swatch. So let's cast on stitches for our socks. Cast on however many stitches your calculation said with a standard long tail cast on using two needles. This is really important so you end up with a very stretchy edge. Don't just cast on with one needle. So my calculation said 68 stitches so I'm casting on 68 stitches. And then you need to add one more stitch um, and we'll use this extra stitch to join in the round. So I cast on all 69 stitches and you can remove the second needle. And now you need to distribute those 69 stitches to four needles, one at a time. And I guess this is a good time to mention my very detailed tutorial on how to knit in the round on double pointed needles. I'll put a link up in here and in the description below because I'm not going to repeat everything I said there in this video. So definitely watch this first if this is all new to you. So I place my four needles on the table like this. Then I make sure the stitches aren't twisted in any way. And then I pick up my needles like um, so, like this. And now we need to join in the round. And to do that, I slip the first stitch of the first needle back to the last needle. And then I pass that extra stitch we cast on over that stitch a bit like a bind off and pass it back to the first needle, then tuck on the tails. And just like this, you joined in the round. This will be very invisible and quite neat once you knit across a couple of rounds. If this is your first time and you feel like your stitches might fall off any time, you could use needle stoppers and put them on the end of your needles if that makes you feel a bit more secure. And from here we need to knit five centimeters or two inches in a two by two rib. So it's knit two 
and purl two across all stitches and rows. Go slowly, it's very easy to mess up the rip repeat if you don't pay attention. It's always knit to purl two. We will need, the cuff should be around five centimeters high or two inches. Um, so for me, that is 24 rows. Personally, I think that five centimeters is a really nice size for a cuff. My shoe size is eight and um, depending on your shoe size, you might want to knit a bit more or less, but I don't think you really need to uh, count rows, just measure it out with your tape ever so often. And if you're roughly at five centimeters, stop. If your cuff is a bit longer or shorter, it really won't matter a lot. So I'm about halfway through with my cuff here and while you can watch me knitting the 2 by 2 rib stitch, I quickly wanted to remind you that I love shooting these videos but I need your support. So why don't you give me a thumbs up right now, leave a nice comment or even subscribe to my channel. So I finished knitting my cuff here and now it's time to continue with the leg. We'll knit the leg in plain stock knit stitch. So it's knit stitches across all rows and stitches, very easy. I'm knitting the leg with a different color, but I don't join in the new color here at the beginning of my round. Instead, I'm knitting one stitch or maybe two, but let's do just one. I'm knitting one stitch. And then I place the new yarn here in between the needle and the yarn. And then I knit one more stitch. And now I slip on a stitch marker to mark the new beginning of my round. And now I twist uh, these colors around two times, two times. And then I tuck on the tails. And this will create a relatively secure join. And then I knit across. I knit across, so it's just plain stock knit stitch from here. And the reason why I'm not joining in the new color here is uh, at the gap here between two needles, you always run the risk of creating ladders. And since this first stitch here is always going to be a bit looser or tighter um, than all the other stitches, you increase the risk of creating ladders and making this join even more visible. So that's why I always do it in the middle of a needle. And from here, it's uh, like I said, plain stock in its stitch. So simply knit across. Now I finished knitting one row and before you start the second row, you will want to keep this join here as invisible as possible. So first tuck on both tails to really um, create tight stitches and now lift the loop that is one row below the first stitch onto your left needle and knit it together with the first stitch. And that way you will create a really seamless transition. And I recommend you to watch my uh, video on creating jogless stripes in the round up in here because there I will show you so many other techniques to avoid a jog here. Now, of course, you don't have to switch colors. You might as well continue knitting with the same color after you finish the cuff. I, it's entirely up to you. I just felt that um, some people might enjoy uh, knitting striped socks. So that's why I'm showing you the basic pattern really stays the same. Now, before we can continue knitting, we need to talk about the length you need to knit. How long is the leg? So let's put our knitting to the side. I'm using my little foot model again um, to show you how to figure that out. Remember the circumference of your foot at its widest point. We need that measurement again. So for me, that was 31 centimeters and we are going to optimize the fit of your sock around that measurement. So take up your tape and put it around your calf and then go up until you reach the point where um, the circumference is 31 centimeters or whatever your measurement was. So, and this will be the point where your hem will have a very nice and snug fit. And now you simply need to, um, you simply need to measure the distance from that point towards the ankle. So in this case, this is 20 centimeters. 
and this would be the length you need to knit. Now, obviously you already covered five centimeters of ribbing for the cuff. So you need to subtract that. In this case, this would mean I would only have to knit 15 centimeters. Now I finished knitting nine rows in stockinette stitch. And before I tell you everything you need to know about adding stripes to your socks, here is one very important tip, even if you are knitting in just one color. I told you that my cast on calculations are pretty solid, but they have some minor flaws. That's why now is a very good point to try on your socks in the making for the very first time. If you have a spare circular needle like this one here, then you can slip all stitches to that circular needle one at a time like this and then try your socks on. If you don't have a circular needle, then you can use a bit of scrap yarn, thread it on a tapestry needle like this and pull your needle through all stitches. And this is basically a makeshift stitch holder and is a really nice alternative. Either way it works and I'll quickly do this. So I slipped all stitches to my circular needle and I already put on my socks. And now you need to figure out if you can pull them past the heel comfortably. And if it's a nice fit here around mid calf where you want them to be. If it doesn't, then there's a chance that's the case. Well, then you need to figure out how much less or how much more fabric you need. Maybe it looks like this and it's your ribs are a bit too loose then okay then maybe if you pull out those two ribs like uh, like so then it's a nice fit this means eight stitches in this case eight stitches less or and if it's too tight how much more fabric you would need anyway i assume your socks fit and we are ready to continue from here knitting stripes is a very fun and easy way to add some color to your socks or use up some scrap yarn. If you don't want to knit stripes, um, you can skip ahead and simply continue knitting the leg in plain stockinette stitch and I'll see you at the heel. Now for these socks here, I'm doing stripes that are nine stitches uh, and three stitches high. So what I do is I, uh, I carry the yarn across on the back side, but I create floats here uh, on the back side every uh, three uh, stitches. So let me show you how to do that. So I'm on row number 10 now and one stitch before I join in the new color. Then I knit one stitch. And then as my new round begins, I twist um, the yarn around um, two times like so pull on the tails and then I simply continue knitting uh, with the new color. In this case, I'm knitting three rounds. And in the next round, as I reach the gap, I tuck on the tails to uh, secure those stitches. And then I lift that right leg here up onto the left needle and I knit it together with the first stitch to avoid creating a jog here. And then I simply continue knitting. So I finished knitting my third round in the rust color. And now it's time to bring up the pink again. So what I do is I pick up the new yarn and make sure, see, I cross it. And then I knit two stitches very loosely. So one, two. And then I stretch out my knitting quite a bit. And this ensures that I'm not knitting so tight that the fabric puckers here, but not, but not so loose eh, the join becomes visible. And when I'm satisfied like this, I, I tuck on the tail a bit and then I continue knitting. I think this is really important because knit too loose and the join will be visible and knit too tight it will be visible as well. 
And once again, as I come to the gap here, I pick up the right loop and knit it together with the first stitch to avoid creating a jog. And now that I've finished knitting my third round in the pink color, I cross the yarn. So I bring the rust color to the front and then I create a little float here on the back side before I continue knitting. And I'm doing this every three rounds. Some do it every second round, uh, but I feel comfortable with uh, three rounds. And from here, you are basically repeating the, these uh, steps all over again. So after, so after the sixth round, you would cross again. And then after the ninth round, you join and so bring up the rust color. So it's always nine rows in pink, three rows in rust and so on. So I am about to finish my ninth row in the pink color. And now it's time to start the next stripe. So again, I bring the rust color up and cross it with the pink color. And then I knit two, sorry, let's get the stitch marker out of the way. Then I knit two loose stitches and then I stretch out the fabric and tuck on the tail to ensure that the floats here on the back side are not too tight or too loose. And then I continue knitting. And that's how it looks now on the back side. That's how it should look like. The floats need to be stretchy enough, but not too tight. So uh, the fabric puckers here or anything peeks through. So I made some good progress in the last hour or so. And I quickly wanted to knit one round with you, just one round of me knitting knit stitches, because recently I received quite a lot of questions how I um, tension the working yarn and how I achieve a really nice, neat and even stitch definition. And I thought maybe watching me uh, knitting uh, for a couple of, watching me knit for a couple of stitches will help you. But definitely comment if that is a topic um, you would want to see a full tutorial about how I uh, tension the working yarn. But maybe you are just one of those uh, people who loves watching other people knit, then I'm pretty sure you will enjoy this section as well. Uh, a lot of people say it has a calming effect on them. And I do have to admit uh, knitting is a bit like meditation for me as well. And of course, um, I quickly want to remind you to watch my video on how to knit in the round on double pointed needles. Um, you will, again, you will find the link in the description below because in that video, I share all my uh, tips and tricks um, and show you exactly how I knit in the round. And I finished my round and I'll see you at the start of the heel flap. So I finished knitting my leg and now it's time to start with the heel. The heel has three parts. First, you need to knit the heel flap. Then you need to turn the heel and then you need to pick up stitches to knit the gusset. Again, I am using a different color, but you can knit with the same yarn as well. The calculations for the heel are pretty simple. You divide your total number of stitches by two. So you only knit the heel across one half. And then you round down to the next number dividable by four. So in my case, I had uh, 68 stitches and half of that is 34. So I will knit a heel with 32 stitches. We will knit a reinforced heel using uh, slipped stitches. 
Typically, the heel is the section of a sock that needs to withstand the most stress. So uh, it constantly rubs against the heel of your shoes. And for this reason, some knitters even knit the heel with two strands held together. Typically, the other yarn is a very fine acrylic or nylon yarn. Before we start knitting, I quickly need to address the placement of the heel. For a sock in one color, it really doesn't matter where you start as long as you knit across half of your stitches. But when you knit stripes, it pays off to do some planning. If you look very carefully at my socks here, you will notice where I changed the yarn. See this ridge here? And no matter how careful you are and how well you block your socks, it will always remain slightly visible. So I recommend you to hide um, this seam here on the inside of your calves. This means for the first uh, sock, you knit the heel flap across the first and the second needle. And for the second sock, you start knitting the heel um, across the third and the fourth needle, assuming um, the, uh, you change the yarn at the beginning of your first needle. Let's do that together. So my leg has the perfect length and here's how to knit a sock heel. Um, I already finished my right pair and I want to knit a left pair. So I only knit across the first and second needle. And uh, notice how I didn't cut uh, the, my other two yarns here. I keep them attached and will continue knitting with them later on. The repeat for the heel flap is really simple. It's slip one, knit one on the right side and slip one, purl one on the wrong side. So it's slip one, knit one, slip one, knit one, slip one, knit one. Really, really simple. Slip one, knit one across all stitches or rather across the half of your stitches rounded down to the next number dividable by four. In my case, that is 32 stitches. And as you can see, I am transferring the stitches to one needle as I go because the heel flap is knit flat. So um, you only need to knit them on one needle and don't need uh, two needles. Slip one, knit one. And then once you covered your 32 stitches or however many stitches you need to cover, uh, turn the work around and then we need to purl, slip one, purl one um, from the back side. And if we, we are not going to knit or use the stitches on the third and fourth needle here. So if you are scared that the stitches might drop off, you could secure them with a needle stopper. I'm not using them, but um, I just wanted to mention it. So it's slip one, purl one, slip one, purl one. And the first round, it's pretty easy to see um, which stitches you need to purl and which you need to slip. For a slightly neater edge, you could knit um, the first round and only start with the slipped stitches in the second round. Uh, I don't care so much, but um, some people do. And I just wanted to mention that. And then you need to, oh, sorry. The, then you need to repeat these two rounds over and over again. Always uh, slip one, knit one on the right side and uh, slip one per one on the wrong side. So while I'm knitting my heel flap here, I guess we need to talk about the length you need to knit your heel flap. And typically, let me put my knitting to the side. Typically, I would say you need to measure the distance from your ankle knuckle to the sole. So from here to here. In my case, that is around 5.5 centimeters, but it will depend a bit on um, 
the height of your instep. Some people have really pronounced insteps and other people have a very, very flat foot. And that would mean that you could get away with a shorter heel flap or you might need a longer. And that's nothing I can answer for you. You need to measure that. But for me, uh, 5.5 centimeters is my ideal heel flap. So continue knitting this uh, slip, uh, slip stitch pattern until you reach th that length and I'll see you there. So I finished knitting my heel flap and now it's time to turn the heel. And to turn the heel, we will need to knit a couple of short rows. But before that, you need to knit um, to the exact middle of your heel. So no matter your size and no matter how many stitches you cast on, you have to knit to the middle. So in my case, I my heel is uh, 32 stitches wide. So this means I would have to uh, knit 16 stitches and I'll see you there. And then it's knit one stitch and SSK, slip, slip, knit, one stitch, so one decrease, and then knit one more stitch, and then turn around. So we are knitting short rows here, and then slip the first stitch, purl three, one, two, and three, and then purl two together. and purl one. And then turn around again. And from here, it's basically rise and repeat. So slip one stitch and then knit to the gap or rather one stitch before the gap. So here's the gap, one stitch before, then SSK again and knit one stitch. Then turn around, turn around slip one stitch and then purl to the gap or one stitch before the gap. One stitch before the gap and then purl two together again and purl one. Turn around again and I think you're seeing a pattern now. So continue like this until you used up all stitches. So it's always knit across, SSK, knit one and then turn around and so on. Um, and I'll see you there. So I finished turning my heel and this is how it looks like now. And the next step is knitting the gusset of our socks. To do that, we will need a crochet hook because we will pick up stitches here from both sides of the edge. Now there's one little difference between knitting a gusset in one color and multiple colors. And I want to quickly address that. So I will cut uh, the brown yarn now and pick up my pink yarn and then I will pick up stitches here from the edge. I will show you how to do that in a second. Then I will knit across here, pick up stitches here, knit across and finish my round. If you're knitting with one color, your yarn is up in here. So you will knit across, pick up stitches from that edge first, knit across here, and then uh, pick up uh, stitches uh, from that edge. So the method is exactly the same, but you just do it the other way around. So let me show you how to do that. Now here's what I do. I pick up the pink yarn and then I slip one stitch marker here to my, well, I guess right needle. And this is the heel flap. This is my old knitting and here's a gap and I pick up one stitch here through the gap with my crochet hook like this and I slip it to my right needle and uh, this ensures that I won't create a gap here and then you need to pick up uh, one stitch through every stitch of your heel flap or heel flap edge to be more precise so pick up one stitch through every 
edge stitch of your heel flap. Since you slipped stitches, this should be rather easy. Um, the stitches should be quite wide and open and your uh, crochet hook should go through that edge quite effortlessly. Make sure that you tighten up those stitches ever so often so they don't end up being too loose. And you need to work all the way here to the top. So I picked up all stitches. Uh, before you continue knitting, make sure that you didn't accidentally skip one stitch and then pick up the next needle. And I always only knit um, to the middle of that needle. And just in case you are knitting with uh, one color, this is basically where you would have to start now. So you would have to knit across. And I only knit uh, to the middle of the needle. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And uh, to the middle of the needle and uh, pick up my second needle here. And that makes it a bit easier to pick up uh, stitches from the other side. And here on the other side, you do exactly the same. So you pick up one stitch out of every edge stitch and then one additional stitch here from the gap. Then you slip on a stitch marker and continue knitting across. Now, of course, I don't want to keep uh, from you that you can pick up stitches using your knitting needle as well. So as you can see, you can, if you're careful, you can also pick up stitches using your knitting needle. Um, I feel this depends a lot on the yarn you are using. Um, see, sometimes it, it works really well and other times I just can't make it work. And that's my feel. See, uh, it is a bit more difficult. And that's why I recommend doing it with a crochet hook because this is a lot easier. And I always have one in my project bag anyway, because you can use it to fix mistakes and so many other things. That's why I always have one anyway, so I might as well use it. And as I said here from the gap, you need to pick up one more stitch so you don't end up with a hole here. And then you can uh, place a stitch marker here. And I always knit two more stitches and you will um, see why. And then continue knitting across until you finish that uh, round. So if you did everything right, and I'm very positive you did, things should look like this. So there should be two stitch markers here marking the position where you started and ended picking up stitches. There should be an equal number of stitches you picked up on both sides. And um, it, everything should be connected in the round now. And now we will start knitting the gusset. So here, this gusset here, and we will do it by decreasing towards uh, the foot. So we will knit across here. Then after the stitch marker, we will SSK, then knit across, knit two together, these two stitches, knit across. Then there's one knit round in between. And then in the next round, we decrease with SSK and knit two together here again. And so on until we uh, decrease to our original number of stitches. So let's do that together. Now, there is a common mistake I need to address before we start knitting. Normally, I don't use stitch markers, but in this case, I do. A lot of people will use these natural gaps as their uh, stitch markers and they go like, OK, before this gap, I need to knit two together. And after this gap, I SSK. And I strongly advise you to move the decrease a couple of stitches down the needle because an SSK or a knit two together or any other increase, it stretches out the neighboring stitches. And if you do this around the gap, you you really um, risk creating letters or gaps and I think it's best to avoid that. So let's knit the gusset together. So knit towards the stitch marker, slip it and then SSK, slip, slip, 
bit knit. Keep a nice tension so you close the gap and then knit across um, all those stitches. Sometimes there are some twisted stitches and then you have to untwist them or some people uh, knit this very first round um, with knit through the back loop to uh, because sometimes if you pick up the stitches a bit looser uh, you end up with holes here as well and you can close them by knitting uh, the first round uh, through the back loop and you won't really notice it anyway. And here on the other side, two stitches before the marker, you knit these two stitches together, slip the marker and finish your round. And then you knit across one round before you uh, decrease uh, with SSK and knit two, to, to, knit two together before and after the stitch markers again. I finished knitting the first round and now the second round is just pure knit stitches. But it's also my sixth round uh, knitting, uh, knitting this stripe. So this means I have to cross um, or create a float on the back side uh, for the rust color. And here's one really important thing. Don't do this directly after or before the SSK. Instead, move it down a couple of stitches, like two or three. Pick something you uh, can easily remember and cross the yarn here. Because here's the thing, these decrease lines, they will, the neighboring st stitches are a bit weaker. So if you stretch your socks, the floats would peek through. So that's why I move um, the, um, the jog or rather the where I switch yarns a couple of stitches down. Don't move it down to the uh, sole where it probably wouldn't be visible, but um, the little floats you create on the backside, they would probably irritate you and obviously don't uh, move it to the top of your uh, socks either because there they will be very visible. Just a couple of stitches down. So I finished knitting this round and the next round begins with an SSK again and, and then you knit until two stitches before the next stitch marker and knit two together and so on. And remember if you are knitting stripes then obviously you just uh, switch um, colors the way you normally would and uh, then uh, well you can decrease uh, using the other color just as well. There's no difference just remember to count rows and um, finish knitting the gusset. Remember I said um, decrease to your original number of stitches and um, I'll see you there. So I finished knitting my gusset and this is uh, what it looks like. Uh, the SSK decrease line is still a bit wonky and you can see the jogs but don't worry about that. Once you block your socks this will be invisible. And even if it's still a bit visible, I mean, you know, this is hidden by your shoes anyway. And here's one important note. Uh, once you decrease back to your original number of stitches, I really recommend you to try on your socks one more time. Because here's the thing, some people they have a really, really slender foot or a really low instep. And then sometimes your feet can be a bit too loose up in here and it maybe looks like, uh, looks like this. And if that's the case, uh, you can decrease for uh, one more round or two more rounds or even three more rounds and then check um, if it's a better fit. So you can adjust your foot through the gusset. And once you're satisfied with the fit of your gusset, simply continue knitting your stripes or whatever and so no more decrease rounds just knit across in plain stockinette stitch. Of course we need to talk about the length you should knit the foot and this obviously depends on your shoe size but 
if you're knitting for yourself, there is no complicated math involved, no calculations, no measurements. There's a really, really easy way to determine how long you need to knit the foot and I'm quickly going to show you how. So here's how I do it. I always knit the foot up until the, I reach the middle of my pinky toe. So what I do is I try on my uh, work in progress frequently. And once I reach um, the middle of my pinky toe, I stop knitting the foot and continue with the toes. This method uh, works for me and most other knitters, but um, some people have really, really long uh, toes. And in this case, you probably will have to adjust it a bit. But um, if you notice uh, your socks are a bit short, too short, well, you only have to unravel uh, this part and knit it again. Not ideal, but um, obviously I have no way of knowing how long or short your, your um, toes are. So I finished knitting my foot. And as you can see, you should be able to slip on your socks without transferring it to a circular needle uh, now. And I stopped here right at the pinky uh, toe. Well, this foot model isn't 100% anatomically correct, but imagine here is my little pinky toe and I stopped right here in the middle. And from here we need to knit the toes and I'll quickly talk you through it and then we'll knit it together. The first thing you need to ensure is that you have an equal number of stitches on these two needles and um, on these two needles. So what you will have to do is um, maybe you shuffled some stitches around. If you didn't, well, then you're fine. But if you did, then you need to make sure that this gap here continues uh, the decrease line from the gusset. So you need to go all the way to the top. Uh, to, to the tip and make sure that um, this, uh, this gap aligns with this decrease line. If it doesn't, then you need to shuffle stitches around. And once you distributed the stitches evenly, you shape the toes like this. Um, if you place your work in progress in front of you like this, then you um, decrease with SSK here on the right side and knit two together on the left side and the same on the bottom SSK here and, and knit two together here and you always have one little salvage stitch if you can call it like that. And then you have one row of knit stitches and then you decrease uh, like that um, again. And you continue decreasing every second round with SSK and knit two together until you have only half the number of stitches left. And then you decrease in every round until you ha half your stitches yet again. And then we will finish with a Kitchener stitch. Let's knit that together. So I finished knitting my three rounds in stockinette stitch and place a little stitch marker to mark the beginning of my new round. Um, my round starts here if I can on the bottom, so uh, on the sole. But, it really, but this really doesn't matter um, as long as you stick to this rule. If you continue um, the, the line from the decrease line from the gusset, then you always decrease here and here and on the other side. You don't place any decreases on the top or on the bottom. And otherwise, it doesn't matter if you start on the top or the bottom. And let's knit that together. So this is the right side. So on the right side, it's always knit one and then SSK, slip, slip, knit. And then knit across to the, to the other side or rather three stitches before uh, the uh, other side. And there we will knit two together. So let me quickly get there three stitches here before the other end, you knit two together, knit two stitches together, and then you knit one stitch. And then on the third needle, it's knit one and SSK. And then you knit all the way to the other end or three stitches before the other end. and do one more knit two together. 
and uh, decrease every second round until you have only half the number of stitches left. And I will see you there. So as you can see, I only have half the number of stitches left. In my case, that's eight per needle or um, 32 total. And from here, you need to decrease in every round until you have the number of stitches yet again. So in my case, this would be until there are 16 left, but the repeat for the decreased rounds stays the same. And I'll see you there. So I'm down to 16 stitches and I already distributed them to two needles and here you can cut the yarn leaving a tail of 10 inches or so. And then we will finish with a kitchener stitch. I'll link you my full tutorial on how to do the kitchener stitch up in here and in the description below. But let's graft a couple of stitches together. Before we start, here's a little tip for those who have uh, troubles memorizing the kitchen and stitch repeat. Write it down on a, on a little piece of cardboard and put it in your project bag. That way you always have it at hand when you need it. Anyway, we start with the usual preparation row. And then um, we start grafting. So it's slip one knitwise, then insert purlwise, and then slip purlwise, and insert knitwise. And from here it's rinds and repeat, so slip knitwise, insert purlwise, slip knitwise, and so on. And continue like this until um, you finished all stitches. And again, uh, just watch my tutorial on how to do the Kitchener stitch. So I'm all done with my Kitchener stitch here and this is what it looks like now. And I guess if you've been knitting along with me, now is the time to congratulate you because you just finished knitting your first sock. I hope it wasn't all that hard and you were up to the challenge and I was able to show you how to do that. The last thing that remains to be done now is weaving in the tails and I will quickly show you how to do that. So for the tail remaining from the Kitchener stitch, I always go through this stitch here and pull the tail all the way uh, to, through to the other side before I weave it in. So I'm on the other side and I quickly change to a sharp a tapestry needle. For doing the Kitchener stitch, a blunt tapestry needle is fine, but I always weave in tails with a sharp tapestry needle because here for this um, tail, I go here through the edges and I hope you can see this. I always spare right through these pearl bumps. I go right through them because the more friction there is, the easier those tails will felt. And um, then I pull it through pull through and then I go one more time into the other direction and since this is a section of your sock that will experience quite a lot of wear and tear you might actually go one more time in the other direction so three times one two three um, I guess it boils down to a personal preferences and the yarn you are using and here's one more thing when you pull that um, tail into the other direction. Don't pull tight here, just, you know, because if you pull tight, you are going to pucker the fabric. Just, just, just leave it like that and then maybe go into the other direction or cut it here. 
So as you can see, I am knitting in stripes and there are quite a couple of other tails to weave in. And I'm not going to show you how to do that because you do it in the exact same way. So you always go diagonally across those pearl bumps and then um, one more time in the other direction. And the only thing that is a bit different is when you need to weave in tails from a ribbing and I'll quickly show you how to do that. So for ribbing, I always go through a rib on the inside and then back uh, on the other side. So um, like this, like this. So as you can see, I spare uh, through those uh, threads just the way I did before, but I go into a different direction. So like this and then I pull through, pull through and then I go one more time in to the other direction. So uh, like this. And again, don't pull too tightly or you will pucker your fabric and it's gonna be visible from the other side. And then you can cut off the tail and that's how it looks like now. And I feel even, I mean, it's on the inside anyway, but even then it's quite invisible. So I wove in all tails and this is what it looks like now. I think it looks so much better than before. Um, there's one thing I forgot to mention, but I'm reasonably sure it's not too late. Before you weave in um, all tails, make sure to try on your socks one last time and check if the toe box fits because uh, maybe you need to unravel it and knit again and maybe stagger the decreases here or add a couple of rows before you start with the toes. And once you wove in all tails, this will be a tiny bit harder. At the end of this video, I wanted to give you a quick tour of my finished sock. I washed and blocked it and this is how it looks like now. The jog is barely visible anymore. There is no hole here around the gusset and the stitches all look nice and even. Now, you don't have to block your socks, but if you want, you will find a link to a sock blocking board in the description below. Still, I want you to know that you will end up washing your socks frequently anyway, and your feet are always a bit damp and warm. So the socks will change their appearance over time no matter what. Still, I wanted to show you how noticeable a difference blocking can make. And now that you've finished your first sock, you can start knitting the second sock straight away. You might notice that your first sock doesn't have the ideal fit. And quite frankly, that's nothing to be worried about. The first pair I knit 20 years ago or so wasn't perfect either. They fit, but there were certainly things I could improve. The important part is, if you took notes, then you should be able to figure out what you need to adjust. Maybe casting on four more stitches could be nice, or maybe you need a higher heel, or maybe the toe box needs to be roomier. And you can adjust these things for your second sock already. And for your next pair, try to use the exact same yarn. Of course, it can be a different color, but if you use a different yarn that is slightly heavier or stretchier, you need to start all over again with knitting swatches. Anyway, I really hope you were able to knit along and I was able to show you how to knit socks. Please give me a big thumbs up if you enjoyed watching, comment with your feedback and your questions, and of course consider subscribing to my channel in case you don't want to miss any new videos. Happy knitting and enjoy the rest of your day.